Hello everyone and welcome to Cycling Research Review. This is the fourth episode and in today's episode we'll be covering a paper by Till Coglin and Tom Rye on the marginalization of bicycling in modernist transport planning. So I'm going to start off with a quote by John Maynard Keynes who uh, is very dear to me in my heart because I started off studying economics and uh, he writes, practical men who believe themselves quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. And he wrote this in 1936. And I think uh, for this, you can also apply this to urban planners and also traffic engineers. And the idea is that what we think is so practical, such as putting down asphalt in our cities or laying down bricks or designing on curves or putting down bike paths is usually behind the scenes informed by some form of ideology, right? So why is it that some countries have less bike paths than others? Why is it that we have different design standards? They seem like very practical questions that consultants and governments ask. But if you dig really deep, uh, you look into the history. Right? and history, and also you look into the ideology about how people choose to live their lives, and also very many cultural aspects. So I think just talking about design alone uh, only scratches the surface at a very low level, and to really understand why we're doing what we're doing, we have to dig deeper into uh, theories and the work that academics have done to really try to conceptualize how to look at uh, urban planning, how to look at the frameworks of transport and how history has shaped the profession and disciplines uh, as they are today. So I got my trusty iPad and how I write this is uh, first I write the blog post and then I kind of riff off it uh, in a bit. So uh, the, the first question I ask is why is urban planning theory important and what use is it to a work for a frustrated consultant who is struggling with the impossible task of fit, fitting like let's say a fire truck uh, down a small alleyway right uh, how do we really get to this point and uh, part of the question is also why do we have such big fire trucks right why are we our cities designed around automobiles and uh, less so around pedestrians and bicycles it wasn't always in this way uh, at some point it happened if you look back in pictures of many cities uh, before the car in the 1900s, uh, this certainly wasn't the case. So there's a physical shift, but accompanying it is also a ideological shift. And today we're going to try and talk a bit more about the ideological shift, which is a focus of this paper. So uh, a quote from uh, Coquelin and Rai, with modernism coming into focus on motorized traffic, and it was a general trend that the street should be eliminated and replaced by roads. Streets were seen as old fashioned places where urban life devolved around people, meeting each other and where different modes of transport mixed. Roads, on the other hand, were seen as modern arteries of cities where motorized traffic should be able to flow fast and without interruptions caused by other modes of transport. Uh, other places where this has been written quite substantially, uh, su substantively about uh, is uh, Peter Norton's book, Fighting Traffic, uh, among others. So transport historians have really realized that this is a problem. And today's modern movement of, let's say, shared space uh, in the United Kingdom and uh, the Netherlands, this idea of bringing people uh, and other modes of transport back onto the street and treating cars as guests, this is re really revisiting an idea that uh, happened at the turn of the century, well, the last century, the 20th century, uh, before cars were really a, a part of the street scene. So we're trying to turn the dial back, but with uh, in a context where uh, automobiles are a lot more popular. So uh, what really underlies our approach to bicycle planning these days? Uh, I think it is, and Coglin and Rye argues in this article, that what underpins today's ideology is still uh, automotive-based thinking, right? Why is it that um, traffic belongs in a traffic engineering department at, at most universities? Why is uh, urban planning based on models, based on mechanistic uh, models uh, that is also integrated into travel behavior modeling, 
right? So why is it that we focus on A to B and how people move in between and the four-step model of traffic modeling? We're moving away from it, the four-step model, but uh, the underlying argument is the same, that it's still a very mechanistic and quantitative approach. So uh, Cogan and Rye then argues, the development of key aspects of transport planning as a science has led to a focus on modeling and other rational methods for planning. We examine how, if something similar could be applied for planning for cycling, it could raise the acceptability and the status of cycling among key stakeholders and politicians. At the same time, the rationality within transport planning as a profession and as a science is criticized and a different theory for bicycle planning is proposed, right? So we could make uh, bicycle planning more like the methods that have been deployed for motorized vehicle planning, or the question is, if we were to develop a curriculum, if we were to introduce a new generation of traffic planners into the university system or into an education system, um, is the approach that we teach them engineering or is the approach that we teach them more of urban design, psychology, and, uh, and other aspects of how Jane Jacobs, uh, Kevin Lynch, and William White approached the study of the city. So do we want our next generation of people who are managing traffic to come from a uh, mechanistic quantitative background, or do we want that generation to uh, have certain other types of lenses of looking at the world because the lens through which you look at the world then creates an ideology through which uh, as an urban planner then you plan and make that world concrete so it's an interesting question and something i've been thinking quite extensively about is uh, if we want the world to be different what kind of ideologies uh, should uh, and ways of looking at the world should replace the current one uh, and many times the default ideology is the ideology that is completely invisible, right? So the, many of us have a hard time imagining streets other than uh, in the form that they are today. Koglin and Rye then goes on to talk about uh, how this more social aspect of, of space can replace the current mechanistic view of streets. And they, they say, quote, even though space is produced through social relations, planning urban spaces specifically designed for motor traffic gives more power to car drivers. So now the issue of power comes in. In the end, it is about the right to public spaces and cities and about who has access to these spaces and who is excluded. When people who do not want to bicycle feel that they cannot do so because of poor condition, this leads to a greater question of whether public space is truly open and usable places to which everyone has equal access. So in the early days of transport planning as a field, resources were primarily focused on building roads and investing in infrastructure for cars and railway traffic. It is only significantly later. Mm. <laughs> I think we're still doing that, but okay. Uh, it's only until significantly later that infrastructure projects for cycling and pedestrians also received significant funding. So there, there is a history to this. There's a history of uh, the practical elements of how the automobile and the automobile industry lobbied cities uh, to create more space for people to use their automobiles. And that comes from a very practical point is if you're going to produce cars and people are going to use cars, then you need space for those cars to operate. But I, I'm afraid that this uh, very practical point, which started out as marketing and as creating a new uh, system for urban mobility has now turned into an ideology. And right now I'm going to go back to John Maynard Keynes, who said, sooner or later, it is ideas, not vested interests, which are dangerous for good and evil. For the past 50 years, our idea of planning has been modernism. Now there, there's shifts that are happening, right? There, there's uh, things like new urbanism. There, there's uh, uh, knowing that we should move away from suburbs, right? Compact cities, sustainable cities. So we are moving away from that view, but the ideology remains firmly entrenched. And then Koglin and Rye then offers us uh, some points and agendas to move forward. Uh, so modernism is 
perhaps not working in this new paradigm that we work in. And as we move forward, perhaps cities need something other than uh, efficiency to create better quality of living for its citizens. Uh, so what can ac accommodate this shift? And as intellectuals and as academics, what are other lenses through which we can view the city? So Kogel and Rye then bases their recommendations on Cresswell's work, who he works in the field of mobility studies, which started, I think, in the 2000s. Um, and that whole field tries to look at the world, if I were to sum it up, uh, as more than A to B. So taking sociology and traditional stationary disciplines and uh, making it go on the move. Right. So, for example, for my research, when I interview cyclists, we do it uh, together on a bicycle on the road. And uh, Justin Spinney and others have really pioneered this method of taking the interview and doing it in situ. So in situations where it's happening. So by doing so, uh, by applying uh, these methods of uh, studying mobility as they happen from a sociological perspective from uh, a variety of disciplines, then we can better understand, well, we, we go from A to B, but what happens in between? Can that also be something that contributes to the quality of life of people? Is, there some, is that a big hole that we're missing in academic studies? So uh, I'll, I'll quote them again, and that'll finish off this video, is that they argue the research on mobility and velomobility offers theories of the culture, performance, problems, etc., with transport and mobility, and this research often has an urban perspective. However, the power relations in transport planning and how these impact on theories of bicycle planning itself are not the central focus in this kind of research. Velomobility research focuses on more social aspects of cycling and on aspects of identity, for example, rather than on one more concrete bicycle planning issues, uh, the politics of mobility, or in this case, the politics of velomobility could then be modified in the following way in which to develop a theoretical approach for bicycle planning. And he lives four points. Uh, point number one, physical movement from A to B. Infrastructure for bicycling without obstacles and the creation of free and safe flow for cyclists. Uh, number two, power relations in urban traffic space. This means the consideration of power relations between urban groups, different groups that share uh, the urban traffic space and creating spaces where cycling is not marginalized. Number three, positive representations of cycling. This means a representation that is adapted and targeted to different groups of people and that creates a shared meaning of cycling that goes beyond class, gender, ethnic and other boundaries. Uh, and number four, finally, the everyday practice and experience of cycling. Cycling should make the everyday uh, and social lives of people easier. Right. That's why we do transport. It's to make people's lives easier. It's to connect with other people. Thus, the infrastructure and bicycle planning must involve aspects of everyday life in order to make the cycling experience more pleasant, right? So we're dealing with people, not atoms. We're, we're, when we take traffic uh, models from, let's say, models of laminar flow and physics and how water moves through the tube and we apply it to how cars move through a highway, we're really forgetting the social aspect. And uh, we see it most, right? We forget, we forget about it when people are in metal boxes zooming down the road. But uh, when we look at urban public space in particular, that all has to come back in because the purpose of transport planning uh, is indeed part of it to get people from A to B. But if we look on a bigger level, why do people have to go from A to B? It's so they can do stuff, they can socialize, they can get to work, they can... Uh, they can meet other people. So we're trying to enable uh, through transportation an urban system that works and we should think of cycling as a piece of that system to make it work. So uh, that's it for today. I encourage you to check out the links below to the original paper, uh, orange for the original published version and then green, of course, for open access. Now I do the uh, quotations as part of uh, the page numbers on the quotations from the official published version. So they'll uh, defer a bit from the open access version. But if you'd uh, control F and 
uh, search them up, they should bring you to the right point. So uh, uh, a few notes about uh, this video series. Um, uh, one, I got a better camera and microphone, so I got some comments from you guys about how uh, to make this better. And one of those comments is uh, that I should keep a consistent speaking pace, so I hope this, this works out better. And uh, another comment was uh, also to make slides uh, and graphics in the, the video. So that's all coming. Uh, but for now, I just kind of want to get these things out there. So uh, I thank you for your feedback. And I am keeping these in mind as I work to improve. But I hopefully this video quality is much better than the previous. And, um, and today is a astoundingly warm day. So I got my uh, short sleeves on 31 degrees in Tilburg. All right, uh, have a good week and I will see everyone next Tuesday.